This is Capital Ideas TV. Coming up on the show, retail icon Joe Mimran on his new venture, LXR & Co. How his experience is shaping the luxury vintage company. We'll talk to the head of LXR, Fred Manella, who sees Mimran as a mentor. Also, from Disney to Photon Control, new CEO Scott Edmonds on removing a legal overhang and driving growth. Hello and welcome to Capital Ideas TV. I'm Mark Bunting. We featured Photon Control in our Capital Ideas Digest as a cover story in early April. I interviewed the chairman, Neil McDonald, and at the time he was busy shaking things up, getting rid of the CEO and two directors, and also busy removing a legal overhang from the company, which was hindering business. Today we talked to the new CEO, Scott Edmonds. He's got a deep history in technology, in running companies, but also for 10 years he worked internationally for Walt Disney. Here's our conversation with the CEO of Photon Control, Scott Edmonds. So, um, Scott, you've been with the likes of WebTech Wireless and Disney for a long time, right. and now you're coming to Photon Control and have come to this company after uh, quite a shakeup. So I'm wondering, uh, what sort of company did you find in terms of the culture, and what do you think you can bring uh, based on your past experiences to, to Photon? Right, that's a great question. I've said repeatedly on a couple of earnings calls that the best thing I found at Photon Control was uh, a group of very dedicated professional people who are very, very passionate about the company and delivering to our customers. What's remarkable given all of the excitement over the last 12 months is that absent a senior management layer and, and really an involved leadership group that the staff themselves have really kept things going. and. Uh, and you, you talked about culture. I think one of my strengths as a leader is creating a very, very positive customer-focused culture. I get highly engaged with people and the new people I brought in at the middle manage, senior management and leadership level uh, share that philosophy and we've been very, very uh, effective, I think, in, in getting people to hook themselves to the wagon and, and follow us where we're going to take the company, which is a very strong focus on customer and quality. And how important is it and was it to, to get the legal overhang out of the way? Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've been involved in organizations suffering from litigation long term and it is a complete distraction and a total value uh, destroyer. Uh, win or lose, uh, it, it, it's a distraction from your core business. So uh, when I called customers after my appointment, of course they were pleased to know that the board issue and the CEO issue was solved, but what they were most pleased about was the resolution of the litigation with Photon R&D and the fact that all of those people were coming over to us. Had we pursued litigation and won what we inevitably would have won, we would have, that would have taken many years, perhaps, and at the end we wouldn't have gotten the people that worked for R&D. As it is, we got the people, we got the IP, we cleared away the litigation, we shortened the time frame for the royalty agreements and significantly reduced the rate. So it was a, a fantastic win. And I have to get, give kudos to the independent directors led by Neil McDonnell, Rona McGrath, and Mike Torek who got that deal done. I worked with them a little bit in the background from January through March, but they really did the lion's share of the work. And at times we're working 40, 60, 80 hours a week to get this done on behalf of shareholders. It's a great untold story. <laughs> You touched on the core business there, and, and we never want to assume that everybody understands what's going on sure. with certain, especially when it comes to technology. So right. explain exactly what Photon does. Sure, that, that's a great question. We are a component manufacturer, a parts supplier to capital equipment manufacturers who in turn supply the manufacturers of semiconductors. So if I can use an automotive uh, analogy, we, we're equivalent to a headlight assembly manufacturer for Audi. So the end customer is the Audi buyer. In this case, the end customer might be an Intel or some other semiconductor manufacturer. The capital equipment manufacturer is making the machines or the chambers within which silicon wafers are grown and uh, the, uh, the semiconductors themselves are fabricated. Now, am I right in saying that some of your customers are some of the biggest semi-equipment makers in the world? And am I right in saying you can't really name them? Uh, that's true. They're, and I'll just correct you, they're, they're the biggest capital equipment manufacturers to uh, the semi-fabs. Okay. And uh, no, I can't name them. But we have four or we have five of the top ten and it's an industry dominated by those ten. You talked about customer relationships. How do you go about strengthening and, and deepening those relationships? Because I understand there's quite a long lead time and then uh, to be, get designed right. in 
So once you do get designed in, then you're, you're kind of set for a while, aren't you? Right. You should be. Uh, you know, we're always competing. Uh, but in this industry, you're often competing with, your, with yourself. You have to execute to an extraordinarily high standard of quality and reliability, and failure to do that is how you lose a customer. Doing that and communicating well with your customers and adapting well to their systems and performing according to their expectations is how you get more business from them. And what's, uh, what happened with the division between the former R&D and Inc. is we started to lose some of the communication that is essential being successful with your customers, and we're working very hard to improve that and deepen our relationships. Your focus is uh, semis, right. but uh, your technology can apply to oil and gas and man manufacturing power. But but um, do, you, do you want to focus on semis and then maybe branch out right. slowly when the time is right? Well, the semi business is growing very fast, is very lucrative, and we are only in one of potentially many steps in the process of dealing with our semis. And we have large share for temperature sensors with our customers, but we also have position sensors, and we don't have a very large share with any one of our customers with position. So we have multiple verticals with our existing customers we can get into, and we have a, a, a multiple products we can get into. So SEMI is where we're going to continue to focus. The company has a very small business in oil and gas, and uh, we'll, we'll see what we do with that longer term. I don't know. Uh, if we'll stay in it, or if we'll exit it, or if potentially uh, we'll grow it. But right now our focus is semi. Scott, let's talk about some of the numbers. Uh, the previous quarter, quite robust revenue sure. looking strong, margins looking strong, your order backlog. Give us a sense of the, the growth of the company and, and can you sustain it, if not uh, uh, right. grow it even more? Well, uh, I, I've said multiple times that Q1 was anomalous. Mm -hmm. the, the revenue number was higher than predicted in part because one of our uh, customers brought forward an order from Q2. Why did they do that? We're moving facilities. In this industry, you have to have not just your products certified, but your manufacturing processes certified. And uh, we're in the process of getting our new facility certified. So one of our customers, a distributor, brought forward some orders from Q2 to Q1. So that increased revenues. Q1 is generally high because it's Q4 for our customers. And so uh, we, we often see a, a, a run up in, uh, in revenue in, in Q1. And we also had a, night, a very lucrative uh, mix of products in the quarter, which accounted for not just the higher revenue, but uh, an anomalous gross margin of 60%, which we have made clear is not a sustainable level. So we expect to see a little bit of a drop in Q2 and some smoothing thereafter. Last I looked, you've got about 32 million in cash. Is that accurate? And is that just a nice cushion or what do you plan to do with it? Well, $32 million in cash is, uh, is a lot of money, but in this industry, it's not a lot of money. We deal with uh, multi-billion dollar uh, clients, and, they, and their clients are multi-billion dollar companies. Some of our competitors are huge uh, competitors, and so we're very careful about how we manage the cash. But part of the mandate I've been given by the board of directors is to consider how we will deploy that cash, both for organic and inorganic growth opportunities. But we're a long way from making any announcements or, or uh, comments about the direction we'll go with that. Just one analyst uh, covering the company uh, with Echelon Wealth Partners. Uh, what's it going to take to get the word out more to the markets, to investors, to Bay Street that, hey, here we are, we have a good story? Well, obviously, appearing on Capital Ideas <laughs> TV is part of the strategy. Yeah. But uh, we are getting more active in our engagement with the capital markets. I think we have a very good story to tell. I think there's been hesitation in the market to get engaged with photon control because of the awkward arrangements in the past uh, with the R&D being in a non-arm's length company. And uh, the board of directors at the time was dominated by very large shareholders. And I think uh, with a new truly independent board of directors, a refresh on management, uh, solving all of the uh, issues related to R&D, um, we've got an opportunity to re-engage with a new message with the capital markets. Now, Echelon Wealth says that uh, potentially, if your company were to be taken over, or at least get an offer, it could be at as much as 430 a share, which would be more than double where it is now. Uh, I know CEOs don't talk much about right. this kind of stuff, but is your company uh, the type of company that where it's logical that you eventually do get some bids because it's, 
it, it would be attractive to uh, other bigger companies. I, I think it's logical for any company that's traded on the public markets to eventually at some point get a bid. I think I, I would be horrified to get a bid now. I've been given a mandate by the board of directors to grow this business. I think we have a lot of opportunity to grow it. We have the products, the people, and the support in the capital markets to grow it. I'm, I like to grow businesses. Our shareholders uh, are aligned with my very tightly aligned board of directors. Our mandate is to to fix it, what needs fixing, and grow it, and that's what we intend to do. And are you buying shares in the company, or what's your? Uh, yeah, I've uh, recently put about a hundred thousand dollars of my own money into the shares, so I've got sixty-seven thousand odd shares, and uh, you know, uh, I've got some equity as part of my compensation package. Um, so yes. So you've got skin in the game. I do have skin in the game. All right, very good. Joe Memoran is an icon of Canadian retail. He founded Alfred Sung, Club Monaco, and Joe Fresh. Now he's the executive chairman of LXR & Co. This company specializes in luxury vintage. So why this company and why now? Here's our conversation with Joe Mimran. So Joe, yeah. you have had a lot of successes in your, your business life. Uh, Alfred Sung, for those who don't know, Club Monaco, Joe Fresh, the list goes on. Uh, so those past successes, how do they extrapolate and relate to what you're doing now with LXR? And co. Sure. I, you know, uh, what I learned very early on was that uh, you had to be a brand builder in order to, uh, to be successful in the uh, apparel market and in, in consumer facing business. And I learned that lesson very, very early in, in my career. And I took that all the way through to every project that I was involved in. And uh, a brand, a brand is, is like a person, you know, you've got to build that personality, you've got to really make sure that it's communicating with consumers. And when you do that correctly, uh, it, allows you to, it allows you to travel the brand, it allows you to expand your, your margins, it allows you to, to, uh, uh, to engage your own people in a very, very exciting way. And uh, I think that's been always the common theme, has been brand building. But it's also been looking for a seam in the marketplace. You know, where is the market going? Uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to use the tired, uh, the hockey analogy, but you do really have to be where the puck is going to, where, where the puck is going to go. And and in in fashion, it's very much that. In consumer brands, it's very much that. Where is the consumer not being currently served? And there's a pent up demand. And, um, and that's what I've always looked for. And, and Club Monaco was that, and certainly Joe Fresh was that, Alfred Sung in the early days uh, was that. And uh, it, it's, what makes the, it, it's what makes our industry very, very exciting, uh, but also brutally competitive. So you think LXR clearly has a, a nice niche for itself. How did you find out about the company? What kind of due diligence did you do? And uh, what kind of risks did you see that may be inherent there? Yeah, so, so the company, when we were first introduced uh, to the company, it was through uh, one of our founder partners uh, who are involved in the SPAC, uh, Javier San Juan, who is uh, president of L'Oreal of the Americas. And, uh, you know, he brought this young uh, company to us out of Montreal. Uh, we sat down with them and realized very early on that they have a, just a terrific opportunity. You know, they're plugging into what is really a huge trend in the market right now, which is the circular economy. Uh, the, the whole notion of uh, reusing, uh, re-commerce, all of that is growing uh, at quite a rate. And it is, it is very much the zeitgeist that's out there. Um, and so, you know, the, we, we love it because it's, it's growing and there's very few competitors in the physical world. Uh, there's many in the e-commerce space, so although LXR is an omni-channel player, uh, there is nobody that's really doing it in the physical world the way they are. And what they found was that they could go into mid-tier department stores, uh, which uh, operate in the sort of 170 to uh, up to say $250 a square foot in sales uh, basis. Uh, they go in there and they'll do as much as 10 times the sales. Uh, in the allotted square footage. Uh, so when we saw those numbers uh, and we saw what was truly unique about this business is that most Canadian companies, they have a foothold in Canada, they do well in Canada, and then they try and expand beyond their current borders. Um, in LXR's case, even though it was a very young company, 
uh, through the wonderful banner of HBC, they got exposure into uh, other markets. And what they found was that as good as they were doing here in Canada with their productivity, in, in outside of Canada, they performed even better. So in the United States, they went into uh, uh, Lord & Taylor, they went into uh, other banners, they went into uh, Century 21, they're fully penetrated in Century 21 and operating at $3,000 a square foot in sales. So in retail speak, that's like dying and going to heaven. <laughs> uh, and so, um, you know, we thought with uh, the group that we have in the SPAC, um, all business builders, all real entrepreneurs, how can we take this young company and really help it, help it grow, mentor it, provide capital, provide uh, a strategy, uh, and most importantly, help on the business development side. So uh, let's take a step back, uh, explain the model and, yep. and, and how they make money. So LXR uh, trades in luxury vintage uh, leather goods. So they are selling the most coveted brands in the world, uh, slightly used, uh, which in uh, say 10 years ago would have been unheard of. Uh, you know, you think of these sort of vintage stores as, as uh, being just these little offbeat stores in, in, in low rent areas. Um, and the, the consumer has really caught on to this whole idea of vintage. Um, the market in the United States in vintage has grown dramatically just in the last three, three to four years. There's been about a billion dollars of private equity that has gone into the e-commerce vintage business. In Japan, the vintage business has been around for 25, 30 years and is about a $5 billion at retail market. It is the fastest growing segment of the luxury market. So, you know, all things pointing to a very robust market, lots of room for growth. And uh, that's what makes this model so exciting. And again, you don't always, you know, to find uh, uh, an opening in the market, a white space in the market, doesn't happen very often. So, so that's why our rush to uh, public market, even though it's a very small market cap, uh, we believe that the growth uh, projections that are ahead really warrant this company uh, coming to market, telling the story to investors, uh, and having them share in the upside. What is happening most of the time is that these types of opportunities are usually reserved for private equity groups. They take it they will take it to a certain point and then bring it to market. In this particular case, uh, you know, we're taking this to market and it's because of the SPAC that we were able to do that. Right, the, the Special Purpose Acquisition uh, Corporation. Uh, so right. so, so um, why did you use that, that approach uh, to, to go about it that way, using a SPAC? Yeah, because it, it would have been more difficult to uh, take it IPO. It is small, uh, one, two, the SPAC comes with a board and with a group of business builders, a group of business leaders uh, that's ready-made for this company. So, so you know, they, they, that's the, the real advantage is that uh, there's a company that is sponsoring, the SPAC is actually sponsoring this company to become a public company. And, and that's really what makes the big difference is the talent uh, that we're surrounding this, this company with. You've run companies when they're private, you've run them uh, when they're public with Club Monaco a couple of times. Uh, you're not going to be so much in the public eye with this company, uh, executive uh, or non-executive chair, correct? Correct. Um, so, but, but, but beyond that, are you, are, you, are you ready for the scrutiny once again of the, the public markets? And, and what, did, what have you done to ensure the success of this company? Because your name's attached to it. Yes, absolutely. And I think um, uh, credibility is, is uh, my most valuable asset. And, and certainly coming to the public market, uh, you, have to, you have to ensure that you deliver on what you say you're gonna do. And I think that, uh, again, this is where we can really help guide the company to ensure that they communicate with the street correctly, uh, that we attract the right kind of investors, that we tell our story well, uh, that if we do have uh, hiccups in the business or if there are hurdles that we've got to, uh, we've got to deal with, that we deal with them uh, very straightforwardly because that, that is the only way because that, that trust that you have with your investors is, is absolutely key to being 
uh, successful going forward. How confident are you that you'll you'll always have enough supply from third-party suppliers uh, and or consumers, that, that that's going to be growing and that you won't be short of supply? So the market is a 50 billion euro a year market in terms of uh, the luxury leather goods market. Uh, that is the amount of primary goods that comes into the market every single year. Um, when you think about the size of that and you think about the number of years that that's been going on for, uh, we estimate there's about a trillion dollars of product that is sitting in closets hmm. waiting to be unleashed. We also think that we are at the very, very beginning of this long-term trend and cycle into vintage. So as people become more comfortable uh, with, with reselling, uh, their product, then more will come on stream. So we do not view supply as an issue. Uh, and and we're, we're seeing even now, um, just in terms of the early stages of the business, uh, how we're going about and sourcing product, not only from the Japanese market, but also we are sourcing from individuals directly. And the response that we're getting is terrific. So uh, we don't see supply as an issue. So your growth plans are quite ambitious. Give us a sense of what you expect with revenue, what you expect in terms of uh, shop openings? So um, the company uh, last year uh, had a run rate of only $26 million in revenue. Uh, this year it'll be uh, 80 million, so growing to 80 million, so growing from uh, 40 odd locations up to uh, just over 100 locations this year. Uh, and then for 2018, uh, we will be going to uh, 150 million dollars in revenue uh, with about uh, 210 locations. So you're seeing a very, very rapid growth, a triple digit growth essentially, uh, which is pretty heady stuff. Having said that, the stores are very small. The stores are 250 square foot uh, size shops, so shop in shop. They're very capital light, so not a lot of capital needs to be deployed in building the shops. The leases that we have, the arrangements that we have with the department stores, mid-tier department stores, are such that if, if a location is not working, it's very easy to uh, close it down, take your, your fixed assets and move them to another location. So, you know, there's, this is not a typical store, retail store rollout, which has, you know, lots of capital, uh, you know, very, very long lead time in terms of building the stores. You have to think of it more in the cosmetic terms, the cosmetic world. It's not unusual for a cosmetic brand to have 10,000 doors, for example. Uh, that's how we view it, and actually we are bringing that kind of talent to the table as well, people who have been part of those types of rollouts. Just a few more for you here, Joe. Um, we're going to be talking to Fred Manella shortly. How, how important uh, was it that, that he was the right kind of guy and the team around him was the the right kind of team for you to be involved with. Yeah, very important. Um, him and his wife are, are really quite a dynamic duo. Uh, they're the ones who, who saw the concept and uh, had brought it to market. Um, they have uh, unbounded energy. Uh, just a quick story, when uh, uh, I introduced uh, Fred to the chairman of the House of, House of Fraser in the UK, uh, and I said, Fred, I want you to meet him. I think it would be great if we can get into the UK market. And uh, sure enough, he was on a plane, he was there, met him, came back a week later, there was an order for, you know, eight store openings. Um, you know, it's that kind of energy, it's that kind of uh, determination, uh, very, very uh, coachable, um, uh, very open, very receptive, but very aggressive. Um, and, and that's what you want to see in an entrepreneur. And do you foresee yourself being a long-term shareholder in LXR & Co.? Yes, we have, uh, we have a very uh, nice position in the company. Uh, our view is to grow this uh, pretty significantly. Um, and, um, you know, this is this kind of opportunity that, that we, we love. Uh, it's got all the hallmarks of, uh, of what I've been, you know, I've done in the past. And, you know, it's got, it's got a brand that needs to get built. There's, it's an international play. Uh, it's playing into a long-term trend that, that really has very little competition for now. So we've got first, uh, first market uh, uh, mover advantage. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, what, that's what we love and, and that's what we want to be part of. So we're pretty excited about this.
He's known as the Indiana Jones of luxury vintage. Fred Manella is the co-founder and CEO of LXR & Co, which operates in the fast-growing sector of luxury vintage. He's also now the young face of a public company. Is he ready for this job? And can he keep the growth going? Here's our conversation with Fred Manella. So Fred, how did you come up with this concept with your wife? So uh, we started the business in 2012 and uh, we came up with the idea because uh, at that time we were living in, in Asia and uh, this, this market in Asia is, is very developed and sophisticated and we felt that uh, in North America it was a bit more of a scattered, disorganized, mom and pop uh, uh, you know, business world and so we figured that it would be a great opportunity for us to take some of the learnings that we saw over there um, and bring it to North America and sort of started the business that way. Uh, but mainly, uh, I think it's, it's the love for the product. You know, I'm very close to the product and um, always wanted to, to, to be in luxury. Uh, my previous job uh, working at BMW uh, was also in luxury. So it was sort of my background and, um, you know, that's how we saw the opportunity and we felt very happy in starting the business that way. Are you the one who named yourself the Indiana Jones of luxury vintage retail? Is that uh, no, I think it's probably it's a story that somebody at the office had come up with sometimes and said, oh, Fred, you know, you're traveling, you're, you're gone most of the time looking out for, for these bags and these, these luxury items, and, you know, we're just going to call you the Indiana Jones of, of luxury. So uh, I think it just came about like for, just like that for fun at the office. It's yeah. catchy. It's good. Yeah. So, so why do you think there's so much growth uh, in this sector? And, and I know a lot of that. Uh, knowledge it comes from what was happening in the J Japanese market because it's been going on for a long time, hasn't it? It has, yes. The Japanese market has, uh, but D Japan and, and some parts of Asia as well have been uh, doing this for a very long time and so sophisticated and developed and very large, uh, large markets. Um, why it took a bit longer to come to North America, I think it's, it's, it's probably partly cultural. Um, but I think that definitely the growth right now in North America is much, much faster than what anybody in the world has ever seen. I mean, um, you know, uh, it's since really 2012, uh, there's been equity injections, private placements done in, in uh, very large uh, players uh, in the market. Um, LXR Co. also has grown very, very quickly. Uh, thanks to the, the growth in the market. And mainly the reason I think is because people, of course, are you know, shopping in a very different way, way right now. Um, people still want luxury products, but they want it uh, in a different way. They want to shop uh, and live a different kind of experience. And also I think people are a little bit more mindful of, of their wallets. And so I think that the world of vintage offers all of that. It's a different experience. It's a lot of fun. Um, you know, every piece is unique. So when you come into a shop or you're shopping online, you're really looking at a, an individual story. So this piece is unique. There is no other piece like it in the world out there. So you can really make it your own. So I think from that perspective, there's a lot of um, sort of excitement uh, around the product itself um, and you get a, a better price for it. So I think the consumer really sort of uh, adopted that and now uh, obviously a lot of, of players uh, on the market including Alex and Co are really running with it. So would you say the consumers uh, see these bags uh, for example as something aspirational but now affordable. They can have a Birkin bag for a reasonable price. Yeah, for sure. I think that, you know, aspirational customers is the majority of LXR & Co's customer base today. The average age is, is 35 years old, so it is definitely aspirational. Um, there is, you know, different types of customers out there. There's your collector that's been buying luxury vintage for, for many years on eBay or through different platforms. Uh, she's a connoisseur, you know, she really sort of knows what she's looking for. But then you have what I would say is the majority of the customer out there that perhaps this is new to, to them. And so um, they have a lot of questions, right? They wonder about authenticity. They wonder about access to the goods. They wonder about uh, who's behind uh, the brand. They, they wonder about quality. Is it really, especially when you're buying online, is it really the quality that the picture is showing? So all these questions uh, remain still today. So uh, we feel that, you know, LXR & Co. is in a position right now to answer a lot of these questions and we're in a good place because we have stores you can come in we have a face to the brand we have a physical location where you can come in touch the product feel the product uh, we are partnering up with very large department stores so you have confidence in the authenticity of the product because obviously I don't think that the Hudson's Bay would be selling counterfeit products so um, 
you know, we take that very seriously. So I think that, you know, we're in a very good position right now because of the fact that we are omnichannel. Um, and so we sort of talked to, to that aspirational customer that had a lot of these questions and we answer them. So we really answer to, uh, to a gap in the market and that's been uh, the main reason for the success of the company so far. So explain the authentication uh, process. How do you go about doing that, ensuring that what somebody's buying is, is what, what it says it is? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really sort of the core uh, value of the company and the most important thing to, to us today. And uh, we take that very seriously. So, you know, when we hire uh, buyers and senior buyers in the company that are responsible for, for the product, we make sure that they have tons of experience working at the houses themselves, working in different parts. And, you know, uh, we have an amazing system that sort of tracks every single point uh, and takes pictures of every single item that we've ever sold or that we e will ever sell in the future just to ensure that we're looking at the right things, we're looking at authenticity, but also looking at the quality of the product to make sure, to your point, uh, that it's, it's the, the condition that we say that it is. I understand that some of the luxury houses have given you some pressure because they think you may be doing something unscrupulous and you've had to educate them. And, and actually, apparently legally, you're, you're fine on that count as well. So explain what's been going on there and is that pressure, has that been lessening from the, the luxury companies? Yeah, I mean, you, you know, the luxury companies, I think at, at the end of the day, it's very similar to what you would see, for example, in the car business. I mean, um, there's a lot of uh, pre-owned cars out there and once the, the product becomes secondary, so once it leaves the primary world, uh, there's really nothing that the brands, uh, so the houses, can do from a legal perspective because it's a primary good, it's a consumer selling to a consumer and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, LX Co as a brand is just there to sort of fulfill that, that experience and that promise to the customer. So we're not uh, a distributor of, of these brands, we're really just sort of selling from, from buying from the consumer, selling to the consumer. Uh, so in that sense, there's really no legal um, uh, thing that the brands can do. Let's talk numbers. Uh, give us a sense of the, the growth outlook, uh, the, the runway, so to speak, in terms of the shops you're going to open, your, your revenue growth plans. So uh, we have a run rate revenue of uh, a little bit over $80 million, Canadian dollars this year. And we're going to do that through uh, about 120 plus stores that we're going to have at the end of the year. Uh, and when I mean stores, they are really shop and shops. And so we're opening these um, 250 square foot um, uh, shop and shops in uh, department stores um, and uh, we do this in uh, right now four countries and at the end of the year we're going to be in six countries. So it is really an international uh, play. Uh, we're very strong in Canada, we're very strong in the US, uh, we have a big presence in Germany um, and we're looking to expand in, in some of these key markets and so you'll see us a, a little bit uh, all over the world. Are you ready for the scrutiny of being uh, the face of a public company? Uh, good question. Yeah. I haven't really thought about that one. Uh, no, I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I mean, I'm so confident in the business model. Um, we have amazing partners. Uh, you know, J Joe Mimran is the, the, uh, the chairman of the International Expansion Committee on the board, which is a committee that's very important. Uh, for the international expansion of the company and so he chairs that that committee and um, you know he has a breadth of many many years of experience so you know we are a young management team um, but we are surrounded by people that have tremendous experience in retail and so um, I think that's a great combination and that will make for for a great success so uh, as long as the numbers are good and they continue being good I uh, know I'm not I'm not scared at all in this segment, we're talking about shell companies. These are companies that have money that is looking for a home, and once they find a target, they'll try to do a reverse takeover. This is the case here with Everfront Ventures, which is trying to buy data metrics. Everfront is going to issue about 48 million shares, and then as part of the deal, they'll do a $2 million private placement at 10 cents a share. What's interesting about this deal is that Andrew Ryu is involved. You may remember this name from Loyalist Group. Now, uh, he is the largest data metric shareholder at 37.5%. Once the transaction is completed, he'll have more than 24%. Now, uh, Ryu left Loyalist Group in 2015, just days before a very weak financial report. The company eventually changed its name to KGIC and then eventually completely delisted from public markets in 2017. Joining me now is Capital Ideas TV contributor Fabrice Taylor. And Fabrice, 
Are you surprised that Andrew Ryu is involved in this deal? Well, nothing surprises me anymore having watched the venture exchange over the last, you know, 10, 15 years of my career. I'm more appalled than anything. I mean, uh, this is a guy who burned a lot of people, including me. I lost $400,000 in the Loyalist debacle. Uh, he raised $10 million and disappeared. He fooled a lot of people. Uh, and it's not like it was a secret. I mean, this was a very public blow-up. I made sure of that. And uh, I wanted to make sure that he never could do this again. And yet, here he is, trying to raise money, and with the backing of some promoters and, 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 and a guy who owns a shell. Uh, I, I shouldn't be surprised, I suppose, but uh, I, I'm more disgusted than anything. And I think that, you know, it says a lot about the nature of this uh, junior markets in Canada uh, that a guy like this can find supporters who clearly don't have any hope that this deal is going to work. They're only doing it to get in and out early on a promote. So based on what you're saying, uh, investors, needless to say, uh, need to be wary here. No, absolutely. I mean, um, you know, again, the guy is a known... Uh, the best thing you can say about Andrew Brew is that he's he's incompetent because $10 million disappeared under his watch. Obviously, there are suspicions that there's more to it than that. There's no proof of that. I'm not alleging that. But the fact is, he was driving around a lot of fancy cars, buying a fancy house, hanging out at fancy country clubs. His wife was wearing fancy clothes, eating in fancy restaurants after. And so, you know, you can draw your own conclusions. Uh, but, I mean, this, this is a guy who, after he blew up and cost me $400,000, called me a month later and asked me to back him in this venture or the predecessor venture to it. And I didn't take his call, obviously, but, you know, uh, it says something about the way people think in this industry, that you can burn people and without a hint of remorse, go around and try and do it again. So would you say there's a certain shamelessness here uh, involved in his psychology? Well, him, um, what do you want? I mean, he probably has a very high, expensive lifestyle, and he needs money. Uh, but it's the guys behind him. And who would ever put their names in their shell, uh, you know, together with this guy and his... I mean, I looked at this deal quickly. It looks like a zero. There's no assets there. He owns 40% of the target company. Uh, where did he get that? What did he pay for? I mean, this is not a real deal. But it just says something about the quality of what goes on out there that there are people who will actually associate with this guy who's very, very publicly known as a value destroyer. Now, Fabrice, in this segment, Shell Games, we're going to be talking about shell companies uh, and capital pool companies and reverse takeovers. So uh, maybe you could explain exactly what a shell company is and what investors should be looking for. Where, where, what are the, 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 not the red flags, but the green flags uh, to, to say, okay, this is a legitimate deal? Yeah, so we'll, let's start with what a shell is. A shell is a listed corporation that has no business. Uh, at one point it did have a business, it might have been a mining company that acquired some claims, raised a little bit of money, did some drilling, didn't work out, the assets are gone or worthless, uh, there's hundreds of millions of shares out typically, the shares are worthless, and there's going to be debt because they didn't pay their bills, they didn't pay their auditor, they didn't pay you know, their law firm, or whatever it is. And so there's people out there who specialize in building shells, so they'll start quietly accumulating the stock, it's hard to find sometimes because a lot of people are disgusted. They don't remember they own it or they don't want to look at it. There's no bid. So these shell builders have quietly accumulated, and then they'll typically reverse split it so the value of the stock goes up, and that, that wakens people up to, oh, look, my stock is a dollar now. It was like half a cent for three years, and they'll sell, and gradually they'll get control of all the stock, and they'll use the shares to pay off the debt. The lawyers get shares or whatever cash they can raise. The auditors get shares. And then they cleaned it up. They control it. They clean it up. There's no debt. Typically, they'll put a little bit of cash on the balance sheet. Uh, and then they start shopping around for a private company that wants to go public in what's called an RTO or re reverse takeover. And that's a very cheap way to go public. Um, the problem with these things is that there's not a lot of regulatory oversight, okay? Because it's they're doing it on the cheap and, and it's encouraged for people who don't have a lot of money, there's, the regulators don't pay a lot of attention. So what you want to look for in a shell deal is a few things. Number one, uh, Google the names of everybody who appear in any documents. Uh, they won't all be there. A lot of promoters are very clever at hiding their identities, their own stock, and other people's names. But at least find out the people who are involved. Google them. Spend half an hour of your time. Look up every name and find out what their backgrounds are, what they've been involved in. Shell builders typically are not long-term 
uh, holders of stock. Okay, so they're going to be selling that stock at some point. One good thing to look for is a, is, a, is an entrepreneur who says you want to do an RTO deal with me. Well, okay, but uh, I want you to escrow your shares. That means you can't sell them for a certain period of time. Uh, the other thing you want to look for is how much is the entrepreneur, the, the target company, paying for the shell. And the way to figure that out is how many shares post deal does the shell do the shell owners own, and what do they what do they bring to the table for that? Typically, anything more than ten percent is, is a lot. Uh, and again, it depends on how much they have brought. Maybe if they had cash in there, then you know ten percent might be okay. But anything more than ten percent, in my mind, will be a red flag. A shell is not worth that much typically. So. Sometimes entrepreneurs are very smart people and capable and hardworking, but they don't know the capital markets and they overpay for the shell. And then they've got this overhang because there's always this shell guy selling the stock. The stock can never get traction. And then you get trapped in these things and they basically never take off. Anything else you want to add for brief? You know, a CPC, which is a, a pool corporation, is, is probably a little bit better for investors because they are uh, issued and overseen by uh, the, the exchanges. So there are tight rules about how much stock you can issue. And, and at what price. I prefer them. Um, they're just a little more expensive. They're a little slower to get going, but they're a lot cleaner than, than shell deals. Uh, and most shell deals, by the way, 99%, if not more, will go to zero. They won't work out. Sometimes just because it's risky, it doesn't work out, but more often than not, because it's not a clean deal. Some recent insider buying and selling for you here. This is where officers and directors are buying and selling uh, the company's shares in which they're involved. We'll have a look at Element Fleet Management. This stock could, took a big hit recently after an erroneous report that short seller Carson Block was uh, going to put out a report on it. Block was contacted and he said, I've never even heard of Element Fleet. So uh, five insiders at the company took advantage of this dip in the shares. Another one for you here is Aurora Cannabis. We have a reverse situation here where a director has been selling 2 million shares, Jose Del Moral. In fact, he sold about 70% of his position recently from anywhere from 236 to 212 in terms of the share price. And most of the insider activity at Aurora Cannabis recently has been uh, people selling shares. We're keeping track of financing for you, companies that are raising money. One of note is SelectCore Alternative Payments. Uh, this company provides prepaid top-up for mobile phones, among other services. They're issuing 4 million units in a non-brokered private placement. And as part of this deal, there are three-year warrants attached that are convertible into common shares at 35 cents a piece. We're also going to take a look at 52-week highs and lows. Let's start first here with Canadian Utilities, which recently broke through a, a level here, and you see it hitting uh, other 52-week highs. In fact, it hit three after its first 52-week uh, high. Another one of note, McCoy Global, MCB. Uh, it also uh, broke through to a higher level here, hitting a 52-week high. Conversely, we know that energy's been under pressure in terms of prices, and not surprisingly, some of the stocks are as well, hitting 52-week lows. Alta Gas is one of them, uh, breaking through the $30 level. And we'll move along to Gran Tierra, which operates in Colombia. It's broken down uh, below the 310 level here on the far side of the chart. So Gran Tierra at a 52-week low as well. From the heart of the financial district in downtown Toronto, that's our show for this week. I'm Mark Bunting. Thanks a lot for watching, and thanks for investing like a pro. We'll see you next time.